So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Taylor Apter, and we are at the Marine Environmental Education Center today, located on Hollywood Beach, Florida. Um, and unfortunately, the MEEK is still closed. It is a very small facility. We are making plans to move forward and open up to the public, but we are just not there yet. If you're interested in coming in person, please keep an eye on all of our social media and our websites. We will post as soon as we have a final opening date. Um, but our goal is to always provide some really cool resources that people can use to learn about the marine ecosystem and conservation. Um, and since we are closed, we've reached out to our very awesome science friends who are willing to donate their time to the Meek um, and give us presentations about their specialty. Um, so we are doing this every Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, so feel free to join us whenever you are free. It is that same link for the rest of the month, I believe. Um, but today we are lucky enough to be speaking to Joanna Figuereto, Um, and she will be teaching us a little bit about coral. Um, so she is the head of the Marine Larval Ecology and Recruitment Lab. Um, she is a specialist when it comes to that coral and their spawning season. Um, so we will go ahead and let her give us a little bit of information about that. I do want to point out that this is uh, the webinar platform, so you cannot unmute yourself. You cannot turn on your camera just so you can most clearly hear Joanna, um, but we will go ahead and keep that chat open. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, issues um, with your technology throughout the presentation, I will keep an eye on the chat and help monitor from there. But Joanna will get to all the questions at the end. Um, so make sure that you are putting any questions you have right in there. Um, I think that is about it for my spiel. Um, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Joana Figueiredo. Um, I am um, you know, an associate professor at Nova Scotia University and I work a lot with corals and their larvae. And you know, so it's happy to share a little bit of that information here with you today. So I'll be talking about inducing coral spawning uh, for the purpose of reef restoration. So I'm just gonna try to reduce this, yeah, so that it's not on your screen. So there's uh, tropical coral reefs occur in many places of the world, but as you can see here on this map, you will see that it only occurs in the, in the tropical areas, so where the waters are warm enough. Um, and so this, these reefs, I think this is a, a really cool map for some of you that if you're scuba divers, this is the, the goals. Uh, of where to go. Um, so this is, this is uh, there's a lot of reefs all over the world, but they look very different from place to place. So this is our the tropical reefs. This is a, a picture of a reef here in the Florida Keys. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, gorgonians and, and also some stony corals, uh, but it is a reef that is very different from some of the reefs in the Pacific where you have a much higher coral density on the reefs. Uh, this is one is in Okinawa, Japan, and there's also more of a diversity of, of corals uh, throughout the reef. This is a shallow uh, reef, so relatively, you know, three, five meters depth maximum. Uh, but there's also reefs that are a bit deeper, so this is exactly not too far from the other picture that I've just shown you, but it's just a little bit deeper, and you can see that at greater depth, there's different species of corals that occur. There's some corals that occur uh, throughout from shallow to deep, while there's other ones that are specialists from shallow waters and other ones that are specialists for, um, for deeper waters. And in some areas you have a very low coral cover. So for instance, in this area, this is a reef that has, you know, just there's one coral here, there's another one here, branching one and another one in this area. But so there's less corals, but then there's other areas around the world that have almost 100% coral cover. Uh, where almost any little space on the, the bottom is covered in coral. So the cool thing about corals is that they can also have very different shapes. And I'm trying to show, show you these pictures to show you how, how diverse uh, their structures can be. They can be completely branchy, they can be encrusting, they can be like a table, um, they can be look a little bit like a, a leaves. So it, they have very different shapes, but what uh, unites them is that they are what we call a modular organism. So they're actually made of this of polyp. So this is a polyp here, this thing that I'm circling, he has its own mouth. And what it, when I say it is a modular organism is, is that it is composed of copies of these polyps over and over again. So we actually the coral starts just by being one polyp 
and then it starts making copies of itself until it becomes what we call a colony. So all of these are different mounts. So all the corals are like that, are this sort of sum of many, many, many polyps. And what is a polyp? So when you look at the coral, uh, you can see usually the tentacles uh, of, of each polyp. And you also see usually the mouth, but then underneath the mouth, they have their stomach. And obviously underneath that, they, they start having then their, their skeleton. And I know that a lot of you uh, tend to think that uh, corals are almost look like rocks and they're not very active, I guess, because they're you know sessile, they're sedentary, they just don't move, but they actually have a lot of activity. So what you can see here in this picture, you can see some of the, some small tentacles. This is what they use usually to grab food and then put in their mouths, but they also have these longer tentacles that they usually use to sting and fight with other animals. Um, and in fact, if you put two corals together, they release these tentacles and they really harm each other to the point that they really kill the tissue of each other if they're too close. So this happens sometimes in the field when they're growing. Uh, and if there's another coral growing next to them, they will fight for that space. And that's why when you go on a reef, you see things like this, uh, where you have this deer on top, this coral is inappropriate. This is a, a, a favid species. And this, uh, this uh, species actually grows much more slowly than the, this one here on top, but is much more aggressive. So he sends his tentacles and literally kills the tissue of the other one, preventing him to grow on top of him. This one is doing the same thing, but you see that it has to grow at a certain distance from the one underneath. And this is probably the distance of the size of the tentacles of the one that is on the bottom. Uh, but eventually probably will be able to completely cover it. But it's, again, it's not growing on top of it, it's growing it at a certain distance and that distance probably the size of the tentacles of the one underneath. And also you see this thing, so this is a big table coral and this one underneath has sting the, the top one enough that does not allow him to grow and cover him and therefore prevent him to access light. So very dynamic, more, much more dynamic than people usually assume they are. Um, and other things that are interesting is obviously uh, corals are animals and so they reproduce sexually. Uh, they also reproduce asexually, but sexually is um, um, the, the, my focus for this, for this talk. So you already have, there's two types of corals. Some corals are what we call broadcast spawners, meaning that they release eggs and sperm to the water. Uh, some species that can be, um, a coral can be just a male or just a female. In other ones, actually most species, they actually are hermaphrodites. So they actually have sperm and eggs and release both into the water. And the idea is that this, the sperm and the eggs from each colony will not fertilize each other. But uh, if they have other corals close by, the eggs can be fertilized by the sperm of another colony and the sperm can fertilize the eggs of another colony. So then they fertilize, creating an embryo that then develops into a planula larva. Planula larva is kind of like a, so this is really, really small. This is something about like 500 microns um, at most for some of the uh, actual larger species. And it's uh, almost like a pear shaped uh, and has a, a fuzzy hair around, almost looks like a peach. Uh, and they use those little cilia, so this little air around it to swim. And so when it gets to this stage, uh, it will start poking the bottom to figure out if this, this is a good or not good place to settle and to live in that place forever. Remember, um, the coral, once it settles, once it's attached before, it cannot move, right? So it needs to, the larvae is the only stage that actually gets dispersed from one place to the other and can actually choose uh, where will they stay for the rest of their lives. So um, usually the, this larvae smell, the things that they like is the smell of this algae that is the crustose coralline algae, which is a pink algae, that usually that algae only grows in the same conditions that corals can also develop, survive and grow well. So usually the smell of that uh, or the touch of that algae or sometimes the smell of other corals gives them an indication that this is a good spot to survive because if the other adults are in this other corals are in this area and they sur survived and, and grew in this area, it means that they probably have high chances that they will do the same. So once they find this good spot, they'll attach to the bottom 
and they undergo a metamorphosis into a little polyp, like those little polyps that I showed you on the beginning on that, uh, when I explained you that the corals are modular organisms. So then that polyp grows a little bit more and then it starts making copies of, of itself and making so other polyps. And that's that stage we call them a juvenile. Uh, and then obviously grows into being a, a big colony. So these are the broadcast spawners, the ones that release the eggs and sperm to the water. Then there's the brooders. The brooder species, they actually do something different. The males release the sperm or, or hermaphrodites release sperm into the water. The sperm enters inside the other colonies and the fertilization instead of occurring on the water, it occurs inside the coral. And when they release, instead of releasing eggs, they already release larvae that are ready to settle immediately. So these are the two, the two basic uh, reproductive strategies, sexual reproductive strategies for corals. Um, and as I mentioned, in some species like the one you, you see here in this picture, you can have um, some species, they have what we call separate sexes. So on the left, you have a male releasing sperm and on the right, you have a female releasing eggs. But most of the species that are around the world uh, are hermaphrodite, meaning that they have eggs and sperm. So what you see, what they release very often is what we call a bundle. So this bundle actually is a lot of eggs together with these white things, which is really sperm. These little bundles are released to the water. And because the eggs have a lot of lipids, a lot of fat, they usually flo uh, float to the surface. And at that point, usually this starts breaking up. So all the eggs get separated. And then there's the white pieces of sperm just get, uh, you know, released in the water and just becomes really cloudy. Uh, and that's when fertilization happens. The good thing is that the idea is that the, when they release this bundle, this, this bundle, um, because of all the eggs um, that are, have so many fat, they all come to the surface. And then by that time, uh, they, they, you know, they, they break down, but uh, the bundles of other corals have also broken down. So hopefully the eggs and sperm from different, colon different colonies will have higher chances to meet because they're all at the surface. And another very cool thing about corals is that they actually have this algae, a zooxanthellae algae, so it's, it's a unicellular algae that actually lives within their tissues. Uh, this picture, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of, a lot of um, resolution, but I have other ones later that you'll be able to see better. So what actually happens is that the, the, an, 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 the skeleton of the coral is white, and actually the tissue around the, the, the which is the, I guess, the body of the coral, is actually transparent. So when you go to a reef and you see a coral that is green, a coral that is orange, actually what gives it that color is this, this, those algae, those microscopic algae that live inside their tissue. And the cool thing about having this algae is that while corals can use their tentacles to catch plankton and therefore to feed on copper paws and all, all, all the other things that are in water, they can also uh, use this algae because this algae do photosynthesis like any other plant and they give the byproducts of, of photosynthesis to, to the coral uh, and therefore um, uh, you know, feed the coral that way. So they actually can represent a significant uh, amount of the energy that the coral needs to survive. Now the sad news is that there's been a huge decline on uh, coral populations worldwide. In the Caribbean, uh, what you can see here on, here on this graph is um, in the bottom here on the x-axis, you have time, so since 1970 to 2010, and on the y, sorry, x-axis, the y-axis, you have the percent coral cover. So this is the, the percent of the bottom of the water, that uh, the bottom of the ocean that is covered in corals, obviously in the, in the shallow areas where, of the reef. Uh, and you can see that back in the 70s, it could be as high as 60% but has been steadily, steadily dec uh, declining over the past five or six decades. And the two different colors here, they're just based on two different studies. Um, because obviously each study makes a different surveys in this slightly different places, but you can see that the trend is always the same. It's, it's just going down. So we're down to an average in the Caribbean to around 10% of the bottom being um, occupied by corals on the reef areas. But that is not exclusive to the Caribbean. In fact, it's happening all over the world, uh, including the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which is uh, you know one of considered one of the most pristine reefs ar around the world. 
what you have here in these figures is first that this this figure app is just a survey of what happens in the crest zone of the reef, and this is the area, the slope. So this is two areas on the reef. And what they have here is the amount of corals they find of small sizes and then of large sizes, obviously in the middle, middle sizes. And in pink, you have the historical amount and in green, the recent. And what you can see is that um, we have many more corals in the past than we have now in both locations, both the crest and the slope. And here in Southeast Florida, where we are, that same, that same thing is happening. So this is a study um, uh, conducted actually by Nick Jones, who's a PhD student at Nova Southeastern University. Um, and, and he looked into historical data that his lab had been collecting for uh, since 2007 to 2016. And we realized that the, the again, the percentage of the coral uh, on the bottom has been declining steadily. Uh, and the, the real reasons of decline for, for uh, the ocean, I'm sorry, for the corals is uh, climate change, pollution, and overfishing. So what is this? Um, so climate change has to do with the warming of the waters. Um, and, and so, because um, and, and the warming causes the corals to bleach and, and, and stress. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail afterwards. So that's a global impact. But then in terms of local impacts, you have things that make that worse. So pollution, and when I mean pollution, and can be you know, fertilizers from uh, you know, fertilizing uh, the grass, uh, that then you know, the, those phosphates and nitrates from the fertilizers that we put in our plants and on our, our uh, grass, when it rains, they get poured into the rivers and then they just flush into the coastal area. And that, uh, those uh, fertilizers are not just good for our plants, they're also good to grow microalgae. And microalgae are competitors of corals and they grow much faster than corals. So what happens is if these macroalgae grow a lot, then they tend to grow on top of corals and, and shade them, not, have, not allowing them to have access to light and therefore also kill them that way. And then on top of that, there's also some overfishing. So fishing, so species of fish that usually feed on algae, so herbivores we call them, uh, and also, um, not just fish, but also uh, sea urchins. Um, so other animals that also feed on algae, their numbers have been going down too. So what happens a bit to over harvest or also do also to the pollution. So when that happens, then it means that not only we have uh, the algae growing more because there's more fertilizers that are feeding it, then you have also less animals there that are eating it and therefore controlling it and allowing the coral to grow. So, but those are local stresses. Again, global stresses are climate change. And the reason why all the scientists always tell you that climate change is the bigger threat is because even on reefs that are very, very far from um, human populations. So in reefs that are in the middle of the ocean without any, you know, without any population close by are still um, suffering and declining. So while pollution and overfishing uh, increases the impact on the reefs. Uh, climate change in itself, it's a bigger threat, a bigger threat, and can only be solved obviously with um, global issues. So um, when the coral is stressed, is it bleaches, meaning that it releases those algae that live inside their tissue, and therefore loses a big source of food. And when it loses a big source of food, it becomes more susceptible to disease, uh, if he has some lesion, he has a harder time to uh, find the energy to close that lesion and therefore to recover. So there's there's multiple threats here. In terms of, you know, I was mentioning to you climate change, what causes this, this warming? So what you can see in this graph is uh, the change in temperature relative to the time of the um, of the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So you have around this time, um, and this is 1880. Uh, and then you have in the, in the red line, you have how the temperature increases, and in the yellow line, you have how the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases. So carbon dioxide is released uh, from factories, you know, from burn, burning fossil, fossil fuels. So factories, uh, airplanes, cars, and et cetera. Um, so those are the big sources. And obviously as the Industrial Revolution uh, develop you know, increase, you know, the, the industry uh, has increased a lot. Obviously, there's more and more emissions of carbon dioxide. 
So it's been increasing steadily. And, and here, this is the increase mostly due to the fact that um, not only uh, you know the most the most uh, developed countries would have um, you know uh, industry, then it, the you know third world nations start having more and more uh, also factories uh, and and obviously and, and sometimes even with less uh, regulation. So still we are we are the biggest polluter. So let, let's not forget about that. But what I want you to see is that as the carbon dioxide goes up the temperature also goes up and it goes like, it's like a, a tendon thing. So it's, it's caught because this is the carbon dioxide that we release, um, creates sort of a greenhouse effect. It's sort of, uh, you know, heating that way when you go, go, it's hot and you go inside your car and we have your windows open and AC off and how it starts warming up. In one way, that's kind of, that sort of glass, it's kind of what carbon, carbon dioxide does to our, um, to the temperature of the earth. So it will, uh, the greater it is that, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the more the heat is trapped inside in, in, on Earth. And that, that's why the temperatures have been rising. Um, we expect temperatures to rise even more until the end of the century. There's some, if nothing changes, and uh, you know, if we continue to increase carbon dioxide emissions at this rate, we'll increase temperatures up to four degrees, uh, which is, uh, would be, would probably would be cause of demise of, of coral reefs and definitely the demise of, of the existing populations. So I was explaining to you about coral bleaching. So what you have in this uh, healthy corals, uh, you have this, uh, the, this algae, the little, little green dots inside the cells of the coral. But when it's stressed, it releases this algae and it becomes, uh, this cells, obviously the, the, the coral becomes transparent. And this is because again, the tissue around the coral is transparent and underneath the skeleton is white. And that's why when you look at the coral, it looks white. If it stays on this stage for a very long time, it will eventually die. And so this is how it looks like. So this is actually a, a montage of a picture in American Samoa. So this is when the reef was healthy in December, 2014. Then he bleached, so he got stressed with heat. Uh, remember, this is the Southern hemisphere. So their, their warmer months is December, January, February. Um, so they bleach, they got all white. And then they, if they die, they actually get the brown not because of the coral. This is algae now already growing on top of the coral skeleton. So pretty uh, dramatic change in, in the reef system and much less um, providing much less services um, to us. So uh, why is it important that we have a high, like a high number of corals on a reef? So if you imagine that this is, um, you know, a coral here, uh, or a, or different. Actually, let's like that. This is imagine that this will, this green dots are different reefs, and what happens is these reef, reefs are connected to each other through larval dispersal. So these ones reproduce sexually. Some of their larvae settle back on that same reef. Other ones go to this one. Other ones go to that one. So they all exchange larvae between them. So they're always exchanging, you know, individuals between them, larvae in this case. But then if a big disturbance comes, so for instance, bleaching, imagine that this reef completely bleached, these ones and also two, the ones that are in green were not affected by the bleaching. What happens is that the ones who are alive are not only producing larvae that settle back on that same reef and, and that larvae that settle on the reefs that are also not affected, but they also are sending larvae to the reefs that were uh, disturbed, so that, were, that, that, that died, and therefore they will repopulate them. And over time, you'll get a population back to the initial state. So that's why it's important that we have uh, reefs healthy and many reefs, the reefs that are healthy cannot be very far apart from each other and so on. So this provides resilience. So this ability to recover from a disturbance. And this, this disturbance can be bleaching, could be a hurricane or something like that. So another thing is corals have evolved in an area that has hurricanes, tropics have hurricanes. But the problem is that Usually they used to, because they were not affected by anything else, they would be able to, through sexual reproduction, to repopulate these areas that had been destroyed by the hurricanes. But now, because there's many, there's very few corals on the reef, and sometimes sexual reproduction is impaired, um, then there's not, there's not enough larvae being released to these areas that have been disturbed to repopulate them. And that's why hurricanes become a problem, because the population is no longer in a state that can even recover naturally. 
So we want to have a really high density on a reef because uh, we want the eggs and sperm from different colonies to meet. So if you think that the blue ones, blue colonies here are males and the red ones are females, you have that when the males release the sperm, but they're very close to the females, when the females release the eggs, the eggs go through the cloud of the sperm and get fertilized. But the problem we are seeing now is that because there's much, uh, there's very few corals on the reef. We've, there's two corals, if they're very far apart, a male and a, sorry, female and a male, each one of them can still be reproductive, but their eggs and sperm never meet, which means they will never make babies, which means that these babies will never go to the areas that have been disturbed and allow the population to replenish itself. So solutions for this obviously include reducing green, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and obviously that's to prevent climate change or to minimize the effects of climate change, and also do inter locally do some protection, so minimizing or eliminating some direct impacts. So pollutants release the fertilizers to the water, uh, avoiding dredging, because dredging releases a lot of sediment and fine sediment that increases turbidity, which turbidity in the water makes less light reach the corals, which means that the algae that live inside the coral will do less photosynthesis, which means that the coral will have less food, uh, and so on, and over-harvesting, reduce over-harvesting of herbivore uh, fishes and, and, and other animals that eat, on the, they eat algae. And finally, one of the things we can do is use restoration. So restoration is by itself, it's not a solution, but it is what we call an accelerator of recovery. And the idea is that we want to increase the coral, the amount of corals on a reef, so that then hopefully uh, give them the tools, the natural tools that they, for them to replenish themselves then uh, by themselves. So there's different ways we can do restoration. Uh, most of the restoration so far has been done using asexual modes of reproduction, which means like you go to a coral, you cut a piece, this is called a donor coral, coral and that piece is then hanged on a, on a PVC tree, uh, on a nursery, underwater, and then it's grown. And then when it reaches a certain size, it can be planted, meaning that we really cement it to the reef and create so another colony on another place. But these colonies have the exact same DNA as the original one. So you're not increasing genetic diversity. You're just increasing the number of corals. So an alternative to this that we have been more and more has been more and more research happening is sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction is when I explained to you before this idea that they release eggs and sperm in water and then every individual is different from each other, the offspring. So like humans, right? So we, we are all, we are not copies of our parents. We are combinations between their, um, their uh, DNA, half of each one DNA and the half that they give is not always the same one. So uh, uh, as we are not equal to, equal to our brothers and sisters, every little embryo of a coral produced by sexual reproduction will also be slightly different. We'll have some information from the parents, but it will be a different combination uh, for each individual. So we're also creating what we call new genotypes, so new genetic combinations, which uh, could be good because it might provide some of those may be more tolerant to heat, for instance. And so if you're, if you're putting a more diverse group of individuals in nature, you allow natural selection to have a, a broader um, group of individuals where you can select the ones who are more fit. If all individuals uh, are very similar to each other, they're all likely going to uh, react exactly the same way to the new conditions uh, in the, the conditions we will experience in the future. So the more different they are, hopefully some of them will be better suited to future conditions. So uh, how do they sexually produce? Um, in fact, corals have uh, spent a lot of time pregnant. So they actually have nine months that they take to uh, make eggs. Uh, so in, in our area here, usually corals, most species spawn between August and September. Uh, and so therefore they start laying their eggs around November, December. And then they start making the sperm usually three to four months before spawning. In the picture here on the left, you can actually see an acropper where a branch was cut so that you can see actually already has eggs inside its polyp mouth. And then it will eventually, you know, release by when the, when the spawning time comes. So they take a long time to make these eggs. Uh, and so, and then they only reproduce, um, so they only reproduce once per year. So once per year event where the corals of each, all the individuals of each species 
synchronize the release of uh, their eggs and sperm. And they need to synchronize it, obviously, uh, because they want their sperm to meet the eggs of another colony, right? So they need to be all able to do it at the exact same time. So why do they do it? Is to increase chances of fertilization and chances that they actually will have offspring and babies. Uh, but how do they synchronize it? And this is really interesting because this is much more complex than people would think. Um, in terms, this is a, a graph here where you have uh, information for uh, the sea surface temperature in the Great Barrier Reef for from all the months of 1980 to 83. And then um, it has um, the indicated when was it that the coral spawned. Again, this is the southern hemisphere, hemisphere so they usually spawn around October, November. Uh, this is their spring. So what you can see in the, by analyzing a lot of these sort of graphs of the temperature, how the temperature changed throughout the year, uh, and when did the coral spawn in each of these years, they found out that uh, what was the cue for the, for the month in which they spawn is the month where usually the rate of increase of the sea surface temperature is the fastest. So pretty much the month where the temperature uh, increases the fastest. So not necessarily the warmest temperature, but when the temperature increases the fastest. Uh, so that usually determines the month in which, in which that the corals in that area will, will release their gametes. But in terms of the day and time, it seems to be regulated by the sun and moonlight cycles. So we always, we know that for instance, these corals are crop roots, uh, in the Great Barrier Reef, they always spawn one, or four, one to four hours after dusk in the nights between one and eight nights after the full moon. And most species really, or most individuals between the nights of four and six after the full moon. So you have the full moon here, nights four and six is when more and more species and then more individuals within the species are releasing their gametes. And it's always at this time. Uh, and this is again to synchronize. So they use the, 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 the light of the sun and the moon to coordinate this um, massive spawning. So having this information, uh, Jamie Craigs, which is a researcher from the Ornament Museum in London, uh, decided to set up this aquarium where he actually imitated the temperature throughout the year. Uh, like he had corals from, the, from Australia. And so he imitated the water temperatures in Australia in this tank, like how they change throughout the year. And he also used these lights that imitate the sunlight, not just the irradiance, so the, the, the strength of the, of the, the light that they get from the sun, uh, is changing throughout the year, but also even the, the, the time the sun rises, the, the time the sun sets, the lights would go on and off around the, the, the sunrise and at the time it's sunrise and sunset that as they would go in a while, then you know that, that those numbers change, change uh, from day to day. And also uh, imitated the, the moonlight. So he also had uh, the, the, the light of the moon changing, you know, from a more light during the full moon and then going down until until the new moon, sorry, full moon, had a lot of light, started going down until the new moon and then started increasing again. And also the moon rise, so when the lights of the moon would turn on and off would be related to when does the moon rise over the horizon and when does it set in, in this particular area. And when he did that, he was actually able to get the corals to spawn in, so release their eggs and sperm in the aquarium at the exact time at the, the day and, and within the expected hours as you would in the field, in the Great Barrier Reef. So this was a, a huge breakthrough because it really allows now for uh, doing a lot of reef restoration using sexual reproduction. So this has been, this, uh, has been now being used now in, in, in Florida. The pioneers to use this, this technique is the Florida Aquarium. And now more recently, uh, then last year, uh, my lab worked on this too. We worked with, uh, with uh, Montastra Cavernosa, but there's other labs that are uh, now beginning to build this, this sort of uh, systems, such as University of Miami and the Moat Marine Lab. Um, so the, our objective is to have the corals in captivity, induce them to you know, start maturing eggs and sperm in captivity, uh, and then release those eggs and sperm synchronously uh, in captivity. And we do this by mimicking their natural annual temperature and also the sun and moonlight cycles. Um, and we feed them, we feed them heavily to just make sure they're really healthy and they're putting all that food and, and lipids into their eggs and, and sperm. 
So as I said, we, we use Montasio Cavernosa, which is the great star coral that you can see in this picture. This coral is very important in Broward County. It's actually uh, most of the coral we have in our area. Actually, let's put it like that. Is a big, it can be a big colony. So it, it occupies the most of the bottom in, 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 in South Florida. Um, and so it is a, a very important coral for us uh, and we wanted to work on them. So we did this last year. Uh, and what we set up this system where we have these two raceways, they have about 22 corals in them. Uh, we knew that uh, we had, I think, two females and one male, and with the other 19 corals, we had no idea what sex they were. This is a species that is going, they're going to correct, meaning that some individuals are males, other ones are females. And then we use this light that you see here on top to imitate the sun and moonlight, and we can also control the temperature throughout the year. So these are our moonlights, the one in, in yellow, uh, circle in yellow here. And the, the radions here, the radiant LEDs imitate the full spectrum of lighting uh, from the sun. And so this is how the system all looks like. So this is the two raceways, the water enters this way, goes along the raceway, passing by all the corals, gets out, and then comes back into what we call a sump, where it goes through a process of, of cleaning. So it has this bioballs where some bacteria live on and actually transform the ammonia that is a byproduct of the, the poop of the corals uh, into uh, another um, nitrogen, uh, nitro nitrogen that is less uh, compounds that are less toxic. Uh, protein schemers that remove the proteins and lipids from the water. And then finally it goes through this UV sterilizer to kill anything, any bacteria or, or other protists or something that could be in the water. That water goes back into the tank. So it's always recirculating. We also have a calcium reactor that is constantly adding a bit of calcium to the water. This is because our corals are growing. So they're actually building their skeleton. So they're using all the calcium that is in the water. So we need to have this to always hand, add on a bit of calcium to the water so that they have enough to build their skeletons. And also as the water evaporates, uh, the salinity could increase. So we have this system that auto top off. So whenever the level goes down, it automatically activates this that brings in fresh water uh, to then keep the salinity always at the levels that we want. And he has this uh, curtains around it because obviously we don't want it to be affected by the lights in the corridor and on the lab that we are working on. So it's all covered. So this is only the light that the corals are exposed to is just these ones on top. So this is the, the, the lighting, light regime that we have kept them in. So this is uh, throughout the year, um, the change in the irradiance, so the strength of the sunlight um, we, the, the lower level we had was something we measure more around uh, the winter in our area, uh, in the reefs, and 240 is like the maximum we usually experience in the summer. So we just made a curve that's changing throughout the year. We use the slides to make that. In terms of the sunrise and sunset, we just use, you know, regular tables that exist for our area, determining when the sun rises and sets. Uh, this little gap here just because of the daylight savings that needs to be rearranged with our computers. And we also do the lunar cycle with these lights. Uh, so we, we have, uh, that is a very low intensity light, but we program and tell them, you know, tell the, the computer when is it that it should have the, the, the highest light, so imitating the full moon, and then it, it automatically does then the, the pattern throughout the month. And in terms of temperature, we, we used uh, data that was been, had been collected by uh, the CCRAMP lab at, uh, at um, sorry, CCRAMP the project that is uh, uh, done by the Dave Gilliam lab, Professor Dave Gilliam that is at uh, Nova Scotia University. So they had all this data about how temperature changes on the reef throughout the year from multiple years together. And we eliminated just the years where there was some bleaching, some stress to the corals. And, and just imitate and just trying to find what, what that curve was and then imitated that in, lab, that in the lab in aquariums with eaters and you know with chillers depending on the time of the year. And then we fed them heavily you know for some of you that might like aquarium stuff this we use poly, poly lab, polyp lab uh, um, um, products and also reef nutrition so this is fish eggs and oyster eggs uh, and things like that that just feed the corals and we feed them six days per week. So according to all the information in Caribbean, we knew that the, this coral that we were wanting to spawn usually spawns in nature between five to 10 days after the full moon. 
uh, of August or September. So the, the full moon of August and September, usually five to 10 days after that, that's usually when they release their eggs and sperm to the water. And that usually happens 15 to 165 minutes after sunset. And this is for the whole Caribbean. And I myself had observed in, in from corals in Broward, uh, a similar pattern. We had found them spawning. We had different days that we were observing them. And you saw, we saw more colonies. So this is the number of colonies spawning. We had a higher amount of colonies spawning uh, the day seven, eight, and nine after the full moon, about 79, 17, 59 minutes after sunset. So well within this range for the Caribbean. This was in 2015. In 2019, we saw something quite similar, uh, day seven, eight, and nine, again, a bit more, uh, a few more minutes after sunset, but still within the range for the Caribbean. So the expected date, so the due date for the squirrels was August 8th to the 13th. Uh, at between 8.20 and 9.50, and then September 7 to 11, between 7.45 and 9.15. And this is what happened. So this is what you have as a male, and you'll see here releasing sperm. So we were successful. We were able to get them all to spawn. Um, so this was a very, very um, good breakthrough that we were able to get them to spawn. And so there were several, in fact, of all the 22 colonies in the, in the tank, about um, 20 had, um, had eggs or sperm. So that's really good, good news. We also had females releasing, oops, trying to get to the next one. There you go. So this is a female right here, just pay attention. You will see it releasing eggs and you will, just in, in, is, has the polyp inflated and suddenly it will start uh, releasing all everything that it has inside and releases the eggs into the water. So we were successful. We were able to get them to spawn and we were very happy about that. And um, trying to get this. Yeah, anyway. So compared to what was expected, what we observed was, you know, they were expected to spawn between eight and the 13. They spawn actually between the 8 and 12, uh, uh, between the hours of 8.28 and 10.30, which is uh, the upper window is correct. Uh, they actually spawn for a little bit longer than they had been expected from the field. And in September, they also spawn just one day earlier than expected, uh, but within the more or less the, 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 the hours that we were expecting them to spawn. Again, a little staying spawning a little bit later. So, Having this temperature, imitating the temperature in, in the ocean and imitating the sun, the moonlight allows us to get the corals to synchronize their uh, spawning, which is really incredible. So we got a lot, a lot of eggs and sperm. And this is just a little close up because we had a bucket full of, of this uh, corals, uh, this uh, eggs and embryos. So they were all put together eggs um, and sperm to uh, fertilize. Uh, here, some of them are already fertilized. I'm not sure how well you can see this on your computer, but for instance, this one already looks a little bit like a, has a two cell, so it looks a little bit like a bean. And um, I just, just passed my eyes over one that had four cells already, but I now I cannot find it. But there's another one with two cells already. So they're already going through the divisions, meaning that they're fertilized. So this is during the fertilization. Uh, so they go from first not being fertilized. So, so this one not fertilized, this one has two cells and this one already has four cells. So it's already been fertilized and, and it's dividing. So then, you know, continuing their development and it's starting to look even like a, a bit like a cornflake. Um, so once they're fertilized, we need to uh, have the eggs are fertilized. We need to get rid of the sperm. So we use our good old gravy separator that a lot of you probably use for Thanksgiving. And we use it because we know that eggs, the fat, uh, like the gravy, uh, floats to the surface, right? So if it floats, you have the eggs at the surface and then you have the sperm that's just all in the water. And then you can use it, uh, the gravy separated because you can remove the water that has the sperm on the bottom out. And then you can just put new water, wash it a little bit, let the eggs come again to the surface and then again, remove the water from the bottom. And that's how you get rid of the sperm. So when you have this, they have a clean culture that, of eggs that have been fertilized, then you can put them uh, being reared. And so this is our larval uh, culture systems. So that this tank, these tanks have a filter on the bottom here that, and so there's water that always coming into the, to the tank. 
and then the water goes out through this filter so the larvae don't get out because they're the, this, there's a mesh here that, that, that is a size that is smaller than the larvae, so it only allows water to go out, but the larvae stay in. And then this, this water keeps on going out, so it re renovates the water constantly, and so we are able to rear them. The time it takes for the larvae to rear until they become ready to settle and attach to substrate depends on the species. Some species take five to six days, other ones take three or four days, other ones take just one day, it depends on the species. And they can be, you know, when they get to the stage that they're swimming, you know, so you have your, just a little video of larvae, coral larvae swimming. Uh, so they can be, you know, pretty active. And so at this stage, they are poking the bottom and checking if this is a good place to live on. And when they find a place that is good, they settle on it and become a little polyp. So this is actually, these are tiles, the ceramic tiles that we usually put on the bottom of the tanks when we have the larvae swimming. Uh, and then they, they, they smell the, the tile. The tile had been left uh, for a month or two months in the same aquarium as adult coral. So it has all the bacteria that uh, indicate that this is a good substrate. And also we sprinkle on top of this corals a little bit of that algae, that, that pink algae that you can see a little piece here, for instance. Uh, we sprinkle a little bit of that on top to give it that smell of this is a good spot. And then they usually go attach and metamorphose. So what you see here is a lot of little polyps already. This is way too many. This we, sh we shouldn't have as many. But we didn't know that they were going to, this was some larvae that uh, actually settled, had a, a big percentage of them settled, because not all of them always settle. And they sell much more than we ever thought. So it was uh, a very successful, if anything, more successful, successful than we would like. And then they grow. So this is one week old ones. They already have a little bit of uh, brown dots, this is already, has already captured that algae that lives inside them because that this most species do not have that algae uh, on the egg. They need to then, uh, using the tentacles in their mouth, um, ingest those algae and then incorporate that algae on their tissues. So he already has a little bit and th this one here, eight, nine weeks already is covered. So all these little dots, these little freckles, like I like to call it, are the little algae that are living on them. So this is the, the mouth and the little tentacles. So this is our Montastia carbonosis with eight to nine weeks. This is one with an, a year and a half. And this is one with three years old. So they grow slowly, corals grow really slowly. That's why sometimes a small impact takes a long time to recover. But we've been doing this with other species too. Some of these have been um, done, most of this, a lot of these ones have been done in collaboration with coral aquariums. So now what happens is each, each, each uh, lab or aquarium can have, is rearing different species. And sometimes when we get them to spawn, we have so many larvae that we don't even have space to keep them all. So what we do is we uh, share larvae with each other. We give larvae to other labs so that there's more chances. Anybody, somebody can try the different methodology and there's less chances if something goes wrong in one lab to have absolutely no offspring. So there's kind of try to spread the risk. So this is for Cropper cervicalis, stagon coral. Uh, these are their babies, three weeks old. They're a little bit different again than the Montastrias. Um, and um, they already have, they start uh, creating new polyps very quickly. So here already have a little bud. And on this case, six weeks, it already has three polyps and it keeps on growing. So 16 weeks already has a lot, a lot of polyps. Agrisia grisitis is another species that we worked with, lattice coral. This is actually a brooder and has a very, very pretty uh, polyp. Um, and so it's a it, it's it's very cool. Um, Pariasis asteroides. This is a mustard eel coral. So this is a very it's another brooder. It's a very common species in our area. Um, in in Broward, if you go dive, usually they don't they don't have so much this mustard coral, coral color. They have more of a brown coral. I all of, I can't say it now. I'm getting confused. And they. But this is how they look like their babies so they have usually this green mouth and then the brown tentacles and a little bit of a brown tissue in between the, the, the polyps. Orbicella favillata, so this is the mountainous star coral. Uh, we have some of these corals in our area, some of them actually really big, bigger than two meters, so really, really big. And we rear some of their babies, again, see here three weeks already has some little freckles, some little, little algae inside them, but as they grow older, they get more and more colorful and uh, have more and more tentacles and, and they just get really pretty. So the last one here is 16 weeks. And this is a coral, uh, boulder brain coral. So the scopophilinatans, we got some larvae from FLAC, from Florida, Florida Aquarium, and we rear some of the larvae you can see here. 
Um, so the porous trigosis, so this is symmetrical brain coral. It's how it looks like when you go on a reef and as an adult, and then this is their babies. And then the gyro cylindra, so the pillar coral. So this is actually a really, really endangered coral. It's uh, locally extinct now in Brow Broward. All the colonies that we had uh, died in the past five years. And now the Florida Aquarium has some individuals and has been able to get them to spawn in captivity and has been again sharing their larvae with other institutes, institutions to see if we can grow more babies to then put back on a reef. So this is how they look like six week old and this is a two and a half months old coral. Uh, the grooved brain coral is actually a coral that instead of spawning in August or September usually spawns in May. So this actually spawned uh, last week at the Florida Aquarium and I was there to help out and to learn with them. And it was amazing uh, to see them. So they have, um, they, they settle, when they settle initially, they don't have any uh, symbionts. So there's a little algae live on them. And as they grow, they start having more and more colorful. So this is one of about a little bit over a month um, with large tentacles. And this is a 10 week old um, group coral. And as they develop, they start making copies of themselves. So you already see again, the new buds of, uh, with a new baby polyps that will start uh, growing. And I wanted to show you this video. This is a polyp eating. Um, so what you have here in white, this, this little stuff that is also on top of him here, is an egg of, of another species. And he's going to try to eat it. So you'll see that it will first push into his mouth, and then it will open his mouth until he's able to swallow it. This is in fast motion, obviously. So now he's putting the food on their mouth. And I was going to start opening and opening more of the mouth to get the food inside. So even these little corals uh, feed, and we need to feed them. And feeding them actually seems to really increase their survival. That's pretty cool. So we do this, these babies, then we grow them in our nurseries. Uh, uh, in the, in, we call them land-based nurseries because it's, it's like in, in the lab on land. Uh, we can do them indoors, so such as this tank. Uh, where I have in the lab a raceways with a lot of corals growing their tiles. And we can also grow them in our off outdoor um, nurseries and outdoor tanks. But they can also be grown offshore. So we can use, again, those trees where we also grow the, the corals sexually. Uh, but where we put, we can put the babies that we uh, grew sec uh, or raised sexually in the lab uh, and they got settled on tiles and we can hang those tiles from the trees, as you can see here. This is actually with a project of one of my students, Rachel Yonata, um, that has been re figuring out when should these babies go out and when, when is it that the survival and grow is not uh, very affected by predation and overgrowth of algae. Because uh, obviously the last time they spent, they spent on a land-based nursery, the least expensive it will be to keep them. So you, it'd be good to put out. By the way, these names is just, because we scientists like to be funny. So we give names to the trees. So this is the Morgan Treeman, and this is the tree Rex. All of them have different funny names. So I'd just like to find, find, finalize this, um, this presentation by thanking my lab, my students that do all the work of taking care of these corals every day um, and growing babies and everything. So a big thanks to all of them. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Oh, actually, I should also say that I need to acknowledge my sponsors. So we receive fundings from the Florida, um, the Protect Our Reefs re uh, plates uh, that people, you can see, you can um, get this particular plates for your cars. And that part of that cost goes into contribution for um, a reef restoration and that they're in the form of research projects and, and works in refresh. So we receive one of these refreshations uh, grants. The Florida Aquarium for the collaboration in terms of not only receiving uh, you know, at, uh, larvae from them, but also the sharing of uh, valuable information about how to keep uh, corals in captivity. The department, uh, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which provides um, funding to support our work. This is the, the most of our funding comes from them. The Florida Fish and Wildlife, that which we would provide some funding, but also permits for us to do this work. The Friends of our, our Florida Reefs that gave us funding to build the larval system and the Herbert Uber Foundation also. And that's it. So I have my email there. So you're welcome to ask me questions now. But if you want, if you can think of something now, or if you think about something else later on, you're also welcome to send me an email.
Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, there we go. Um, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. We do have quite a few questions in the chat, which either I think you should be able to bring up yourself or I could read them off to you. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Go to the top. <laughs> you. How do science learn about algae smell that makes corals want to settle? Well, um, they we've tested it. So we've tested, uh, we had larvae and we ex uh, ex exposed them to different uh, types of algae, to different corals, sometimes just coral skeleton or nothing. And then we figure out and, and then counted how many larvae would actually settle on, on that substrate. So we were able to find that uh, th there's some particular algae, uh, there are um, cues for settlement. In fact, when I say crostose coralline algae, there's multiple species of crostose coralline algae, and some corals use some species and other ones use other ones. And I guess it, it's, um, it depends on whatever condition that algae likes to grow, and probably those conditions are the same conditions that that coral likes to grow in. Uh, the second question from Matt. Uh, so are the global stresses like climate change causing more diseases in corals since they are stressed out? Can we save corals if it is bleached but not dead yet? Um, so definitely yes. So whenever coral is stressed and is bleached, she has one as less uh, sources of food, less less energy. So we will have a harder time to find uh, to fight uh, pathogens. For instance, you can think about us and how when we are more tired, we don't have enough sleep, our immune system immunity system is weaker. So the same thing kind of happens to the coral. So if they have been stressed. Um, they will be more likely to, to have their get diseases because their immunity system is compromised. Um, and, and can a coral be saved if it is bleached? Depends how for how long has it been bleached for and depends on the species. Some species are very just bleach and just die because they just really don't like it at all, at all. Other ones seem to be able to recover. A lot depends on for how long they stay bleached. Um, so can, we can save corals can can recover from bleaching um, in the wild. Um, if, 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 they, if they get healthy again, they can just, again, acquire again, this new algae from the water and get color again. But usually that time that they are without that extra source of food usually compromises their uh, immunity system again and you know, their ability to grow and reproduce and all those things. So Skylar is asking, so does this mean scientists can break coral in captivity that would otherwise go extinct? Yes. Um, yeah, so, so what uh, Skylar is asking is, okay, we can grow corals in captivity that would otherwise go extinct uh, because, so for instance, some, some coral species now are in such low numbers like the pillar cor coral um, that the eggs and sperm from different colonies never get to meet, so they never create babies, right? So the fact that we can do that in captivity is great. But Skylar is also correct that if we just go in ahead and put these babies back in the wild, and if the stresses are still there, it is likely that a lot of them will die too. But what you expect is that because there's been more genetic recombination, maybe some of those babies are a bit more tolerant to heat, and therefore they will be more able to cope with slightly warmer waters or slightly a little bit more higher pollution. But we don't know. The fact That's why I said restoration in itself is not the solution. You do still need to tackle climate change, so decrease carbon emissions and also prevent um, local stressors, so pollution and dredging and, and overfishing. And all those things together will allow the actually restoration to be a success because restoration alone does not solve it. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, yeah, doesn't, doesn't, cannot save the populations on, in the wild. It could only keep them in captivity, which is, uh, we always joke that it's only one pump away from, from dying because you know that when you have aquariums, there's always some equipment that can fail. Obviously, if multiple aquariums have this species, more likely you will always be able to keep some individuals, but it, it's, it's not a solution, right? It's not a solution. Um, if overfeeding them in captivity increases their survival, does this indicate that there might be some food limitations in the wild contributing to their population decline? It's possible. Uh, we don't know if it is a question of 
uh, I don't know if we overfeed them. I think we're just trying to feed them because in a while they're feeding throughout the day and why we just feed them uh, you know, at one hour of the day. So I don't think we are overfeeding them. In terms of the food availability in wild, we do not know if the plankton composition has been changing a little bit too. Obviously we expect it to change too as warming happens. Also species that can deal with better with warmer conditions will thrive while other ones that do not will not make it and disappear. So the, it, might, it is possible that their food in the wild is also slightly changing or even abundance of the, that food is changing. Um, okay, so why do corals release their algae when they're stressed? Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that um, the algae then starts, uh, creates, creates this sort of reaction inside that they almost like they're, like they're too demanding <laughs> for like that. So if the coral is unhappy, I'm just putting this in a very, very general way. Um, there's a there's a much more detailed uh, physiology answer to this, but pretty much I guess it has to do with the fact that this algae, um, when they do not are not do not receive uh, food from the coral, it also creates some stress inside their cells. So actually, the coral is better off without them than with them uh, during a stress event. Okay, so any advice for those interested in this field and are there any skills or certifications that they should start working on? Um, I think there's two things that are really good. Uh, one is becoming a scuba diver. And the second one is doing internships at um, aquariums that do um, doing uh, aquariums and also um, institutions that do restoration in the field such as the coral reef restoration, um, Foundation, uh, the you know I know the Florida Aquarium has some internship programs. Also, the Moat Marine Lab has also internships. So internships um, and scuba diving, both in aqua internships, both in aquarium, as in labs, or even like in some internship that involves doing field work on coral reefs would probably be a good a good, a good advice. Um, so Rachel here is Rachel Leonata, as you see here on the, on the chat. She's uh, advertising the YouTube channel for our lab. So if you want to see more of these videos and pictures, please go to this YouTube channel and you'll see much more there. And I think, I think that I get all the questions now. I do believe that is it. Um, thank you so much. That was so cool. Uh, very, very interesting. And I agree with our chat. We learned so much today. Um, if anyone missed any of it or you wanted to share it with someone else, this is recorded. We'll post it to our YouTube channel. And thank you so much. I'll be sure to tag your social media and YouTube channel on mm -hmm. that website as well. In case anyone missed that, definitely check it out. Um, those pictures and videos like are things like you'll never see anywhere else. So, like it was a very interesting uh, presentation. So thank you. Thank you, um, Taylor. Thank if, you, everyone. Of course. If anyone has any other questions, um, feel free to email us and I definitely won't be able to answer them. So I will definitely send them right along to the Coral Lab, um, but we will make sure to get them answered. Uh, and if you are available uh, next Saturday at 1 p.m., let me think we have, oh, we have our next webinar is actually the Meek Educator. So I will be there uh, with our other educator, Carly, and we'll be talking all about trophic dynamics and uh, food web ecology. So it's a, a much, broader topic than we've been doing. Um, but if you have any questions um, and want to learn a little bit about how the marine food web works, uh, please join us the same link that you used today. Um, and we will see you next week. But otherwise, thank you very much for everyone for coming today. Those were some great questions. And thank you again for presenting. That was so cool.